My name is Scott Park, Park Farming. Uh, we farm up in Meridian and today we're going to talk about water management and its relationship to soil health and the overall productivity of the farm. We farm approximately 1,700 acres. We have uh, 27 fields. They're all certified organic except for one that's in transition. I started in 1974 and farmed intensely conventional. On organic, you're, you're more positioning yourself in the long run of taking care of the ground over time and building up the soil. And, and by doing so, what it is is because you know you can't turn to chemicals, you have to solve the problem before it happens. And the way in organic farming that you solve the problem before it happens is healthy soil. I think water and soil health go hand in hand as much or more than any other aspect of farming. We could use this field as an example. The tomato crop is grown over 125 days, so I can plant, not irrigate, for 40 some days. Then I irrigate quite a bit for 40 days because there's a huge growing push for the tomatoes, and then I can cut the water for the last 40 days to 45 days. The way that I'm able to do that is that the soil works so well on holding water. If you can get your soil structure right, it solves almost all your irrigation problems. The way to describe our system is the seven C's, okay? And the seven C's, the three most important are cover crops and crop rotation and conservation tillage. And then the other C's that follow are crop residue, don't ever burn or bale anything, controlled traffic, have, which I'll touch on, and then uh, compost, and, and the last, which is some of the result of the others, is conserve inputs. We have a goal of having some living roots in the ground 365 days a year, and, and cover crops help, is what help, lets us do that. Uh, growing cash crops 365 days a year in this Mediterranean climate where we are, you know, you simply, it, it wouldn't work. Our mix of crops, which is critical to the soil health, is crop rotation. And, and so we'll be growing our base crops are like tomatoes, wheat, corn, dry beans, different seed crops, and alfalfa. And, and that rotation is geared toward one crop helping the next crop. You can't just monoculture your ground. So each crop is kind of doing the next crop an advantage, be it whether CN ratio, volume of carbon, or weed control, pest control. Uh, this overall strategy, like in the last 10 years, on, on 1,700 acres of 27, 27 fields, all the different crops, we've used almost zero insecticides or fungicides, that the fields take care of themselves due to the soil being relatively healthy. On the conservation tillage side, we just do whatever we, the least amount that we need to do. And as our ground gets better, we're spending more tillage only in the furrows and not on top of the bed. And this combines with the other question on traffic is controlled traffic. Like this field we're standing in now, these furrows are the same furrows in the exact same location that they were 10 years ago. So all our tractors run on RTK sub one inch. And, and by doing so, all our compaction is occurring only in the furrows and the top of the bed, 42 inches of the 60 inches doesn't have any weight to speak of put on it. And, and so that's really helping leaving all the microbial system alone as much as possible and letting it develop. No more do we ever run rippers and deep tillage across the beds. So tillage is isolated to basically approximately a third of the ground. And, and the rest, the other two thirds, we pretty much leave alone as long as we can. And then adding the crop residue, adding um, all the cover crops, using compost, all that's building and making the ground healthier and healthier. And the end result is conserving, when I say conserving inputs, is that you don't use as much water, you don't use as many plants, 
you don't use as much nitrogen and you don't need to do as much tillage. If you're doing the other six operations, what falls in place is you are now conserving your inputs and you're basically letting the soil health run the system. For example, on tomatoes, we only plant single row. We plant 7,000 plants instead of 9,000 plants. We never put any nitrogen on during the season. We only irrigate a third of the season and we basically do no tillage throughout the season. We do work the furrows before. So that's conserving inputs. That's letting Mother Nature, the health of the soil, run the system. At this point now, I'm I'm the oddball on furrow irrigating, and, and most guys are drip irrigating. And they're they're drip irrigating. They are getting um, they are getting higher yields. But in the same sense, now they're also starting to see problems of disease and weeds from having a monoculture. When you put a drip system in, you're no longer the farmer of the ground. This is from my perspective because you just spent so much money on that system, you have to grow high value crops in order to warrant the expense that you have into it. So the thoughts of growing a crop rotation like right here where this field was in wheat last year, it wouldn't make any sense at all to plant wheat if you have a drip system. Why don't I have a drip system? Drip systems are fine, but on organic, when I'm putting 10 to 15 tons of biomass in a year and I'm growing cover crops, and the interest of my farm is the soil health and making it all as healthy as possible, and then you have a drip system. In the drip system, you have a really limited wetting pattern for the most part, and so all your nutrients have to be fed in there. Well, what about all the nutrients that I spent all this time trying to make the soil healthy? And basically, from my perspective, the whole microbial system somewhat goes to sleep. And, and, and I've got to feed everything through that drip system. In my, the, in the way we have it is we basically, as I gave the example in the tomatoes, we plant it, we just let the plants grow. It comes to a point it, it needs it, it, at, the, at some point, because the growth is so great, we, we do give it a, uh, a healthy amount of water in the middle of the season, and then we leave it alone. And the roots have grown well, and they're all taking advantage of, of a, an abundance of, of nutrient availability spread wide and deep, and, and it's all available instead of concentrated in a small area. I'm not getting a bunch of weeds by having to worry and irrigate early because the plant can't take them himself. And, and I'm not having to irrigate less, late because I'm worried that the root system isn't developed well, so I've got to spoon feed the plant with water all the time. So having that sort of irrigation regimen, uh, I really, for furrow irrigation, I'm using definitely less water. There's almost no water leaving the field, but I'm getting really good quality. And, and quality is a big deal. In the, in the farm world, especially in California with all the competition, because if you don't perform, somebody else will take your contract tomorrow. And if you can be delivering quality by not sending in red water balls, but instead sending in tasty, high solids, good textured tomatoes with good color, you keep your tomato contracts. As far as sprinkling, for example, the field that we're in here, we are going to uh, we sprinkle fields like this because this is this is heavy clay, and so we sprinkle it. The reason we don't sprinkle all the time is that on growing crops like tomatoes is because of the, the you have more disease, um, you have more problems late in the season, you also have more problems sort of filling the soil profile deep uh, if you can get the water percolation fast enough. And it's also energy costs. Like for us, we're in a, in a system that of 10,000 acres. So once the water's lifted out of the river, every field is lower than the next field. And so we don't have to spend money, use energy pumping water twice. It just flows once. We try to stay away from wetting the top of the beds. Uh, mostly because we don't have any herbicides. And so if we can keep the top three inches dry, that solves, and, and furrow irrigating helps that because the water does move down, the top stays dry, the top couple inches, and, and, and so we don't have the weed pressures. 90% of weeds come from the top two to three inches. We used to use tensiometers. When I started farming 45 years ago, we were using 
the tensiometers, and, and they were advantageous. They're a good learning tool, but they certainly shouldn't be the tool. The tool should be a shovel and a soil probe and your five senses and comparing what the plants look like to what the soil looks like to where the roots are and getting a correlation between all three of them. Uh, so my son, I've discouraged any sort of technology as he's been farming with me now for 12 years and I wanted him to understand the, the five cents part of connecting with the soil and not just using his iPhone and readouts telling him that the moisture is good or the moisture is bad, but he doesn't really know what that means. So I think that's really important that, that you, you can tie it, the plant, soil, moisture, roots, all of it together. Now we are gonna start using some aerial imaging just to sort of tie it to, you know, kind of broaden my son's better understanding. And, and it'll also show some on nutrition and, and biomass. So it's, it's advantageous to do. I, I don't discourage technology in any way. I just say that, that, that you should have the basics before you turn to printouts to make your decisions. It's so easy to blow a crop with water. And so like our farm system, is when we come into the spring, the, the plate's set per se. You know, we've grown the cover crop, we put on the compost in the fall. So going into the spring and the summer and growing the crop, if you have both resilience and I say forgiveness, because things go wrong when you irrigate. And, and the fact that, that your soil is healthy, it can take a hair too much water if you blow it. It can take it if you don't give it quite enough because the root system's good. If your soil's friable, that the key is oxygen. And so if your ground is dead and, and there's no air and it's like a brick and you put water in there and your roots are there, you've just strangled it. So soil structure from a good soil health farm system gives you that margin of air of irrigating. If you're late, you're okay. If you're here early, you're okay. But that combination of, of the healthy soil and the oxygen in there, that it, that it can take it and keep your roots white is, is so important because that's like for us, once we've set the table, water management decides our quality and our yield. And, and if you can't do it well, you can spend money into your whatever, your Bill Gates, it won't matter. You gotta have the soil in a healthy structure, and that healthy structure comes from cover crops, crop rotation, and diversity.